<clears throat> okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Mythgard Academy. This is our uh, series on Sir Thomas Mallory's Le Morte d'Arthur, session number 14. As we continue to chug right along tonight, uh, we are back to the Book of Sir Gareth. I'm going to see if we can finish the Book of Sir Gareth tonight. A lot to talk about, um, but <laughs> it's a heck of a lot of fun. Tonight might contain my second favorite passage. It's kind of hard to vie with the Necrophiliac Sorceress passage. I mean, you know, the Book of Sir Lancelot is just a gift that keeps on giving. But uh, the Book of Sir Gareth, I, I said before that he's really adorable, right? I mean, come on. It just doesn't get much cuter <laughs> than what happens in the second half here. Um, anyway, okay. So we'll get there. Uh a couple quick announcements first. Uh, uh, one, okay, well, two reminders, which should be familiar to many of you, um, but I want to keep mentioning them because they're coming up fast and it's uh, increasingly urgent, and that is, of course, our upcoming moots. We have LA Moot happening in a week and a half on the 27th of October um, uh, up near LAX. Uh, you can uh, check out the venue and information and everything on the Signum website. So if you go to... Um, if you go to signumuniversity.org, scroll down just a little bit and you'll see the link to LA Moot, or you can go to lamoot.org. I really hope you'll be able to join us. We've had a whole bunch of people uh, <laughs> signing up, <laughs> a whole bunch of people signing up for uh, 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 for LA Moot in the last few days. So that's been really cool to see, and I hope that you'll be able to come and join us. Uh, it's going to be a really fun gathering. So, um, yeah, we're going to be talking about adaptation, um, adaptation theory, looking at different approaches to adaptation. We're going to have, I'm going to come and give a talk uh, about Tolkien and adaptation, like Tolkien's attitude towards adaptation, uh, and thinking a little bit more about sort of what it means to follow some of Tolkien's own injunctions uh, about adaptation. And uh, and there's going to be, we're going to have a couple panels from the One Ring.net who are going to come and, and, and t do some kind of uh, retrospective uh, discussions on the Peter Jackson adaptations, which should be a lot of fun. Um, it's going to be great. So we're going to have a great time. And uh, I hope you'll be able to join us 27th of October near LAX. Um, and uh, again, so lamoot.org or go to the LA Moot event page on the Signum University home site. And you'll find that. The second, of course, is... Magnolia Moot, uh, which is coming up not quite so soon, but not too long after either. A mere two weeks after LA Moot, we're going to be in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, for our uh, uh, our our Moot down south of the Mason Dixon line over there. Um, it's going to be great fun. I love being in Charlotte. Uh, we're going to be at uh, Johnson C. Smith University, which is a very uh, a very familiar location to me that I, I love going down to visit folks at Johnson C. Smith. Uh, they're going to host us there for uh, uh, for Magnolia Moot. Uh, again, going to be a great day uh, down there in Charlotte. So if you're anywhere nearby, I hope you'd be able to drive in and join us. Uh, we're going to be, um, there, again, that's the 10th of November is the date for that. Now, um, the... Um, Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, I just saw your registration come through, Josiah. Awesome. Yeah. I'm um, glad you can join us there for Magnolia Moot. Um, so, um, yeah, anyway, so that's the, those are going to be great. Hope you can join us uh, for those things. One last quick announcement, um, which is a, a, a brand new thing, uh, which I wanted to draw your attention to, which just uh, launched today. And that is we're ha having a, a, a special... Uh, a special feature on the Canterbury Tales class that I taught a couple years back um, in honor of uh, uh, the anniversary of Chaucer's death, which is coming up soon. He died in, in uh, near the end of October in the year 1400. Uh, so to celebrate uh, the 618th anniversary uh, of Chaucer's death, um, we are uh, uh, we are. Uh, running a, a special on my Canterbury Tales class. So this is in our Anytime Audit program, um, which is a super fun program. So any of the courses that we've taught over the years, you can get access to essentially like a kind of a great books class or something like that, or great courses, I mean, um, uh, where you'll get access to all of the lecture materials. So you'll get all the audio and video files for all of the lecture materials. Plus, you'll get access to the whole you know schedule. So you can re go through the schedule and follow along uh, with the readings as well as with the uh, with the, the lectures, but you also get all of the supplemental materials as well. So all the handouts and everything that everybody in the class got. And since you're an anytime auditor, that means that you are officially asynchronously 
an auditing student of Signum University, which means you get access to our library resources and stuff. So uh, um, anyway, that it's it's a it's a pretty. It's a pretty cool thing, uh, anytime auditing. So uh, special for this, it's only $75 tuition uh, to get access to the Canterbury Tales class. So anyway, um, just wanted to, and that's going to be running through the end of the month. So we have just have just, 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 just a couple weeks uh, uh, on that. Um, Zach asks, is it best to do Chaucer 1 before Chaucer 2? You certainly can. Um, I, I so okay basically I did uh I broke those two classes up mostly chronologically essentially Chaucer 2 is the Canterbury Tales like we just do the Canterbury Tales uh Chaucer 1 is like everything else uh so his early uh, uh, uh dream vision poems uh and then of course Troilus and Crusade which is the the, the sort of the heart of the um, uh of the first course so if you want to read more of like Chaucer, Chaucer's reputation during his lifetime, especially, was primarily for, as a love poet. Like he was one of the great love poets um, because of his dream vision poetry, and especially for Troilus and Crusade, which is one of the great love poems of the Middle Ages. Um, so, really great stuff there. Really interesting, thoughtful engagement with uh, the courtly love tradition, and and uh, and some really delightful um, poetry, certainly. The Canterbury Tales, of course, is sort of the thing that has, I was about to say, has lingered most, as if it were like a rash or something. Uh, no, I mean, it is what the, the thing that has certainly endured longest, and, and of course, it's, it's absolutely brilliant and wonderful. Um, I have to admit, Troilus and Crusade is one of my uh, favorite all-time poems. I love Troilus and Crusade. I did my dissertation uh, uh, divided between two uh, poems, but Troilus and Crusade uh, was one of them. Um, that in uh, Pierce Plowman uh, by Langland was what I did my t dissertation on ages ago. Um, but anyhow, yeah. So, so Zach, it's not like they're, they're not exactly. It's an, it's not exactly a prereq. It's like it's not like you won't you know understand what's going on, right? Because we just start from the beginning of the Canterbury Tales and go straight through um, without an enormous amount of reference to what we did before. Because again, it's just a different body of materials. Um, but. Um, uh, but the Chaucer One class is fun too, uh, and certainly you'll see a lot of the same kind of stuff that we're, that we've been kind of talking around um, the whole courtly love tradition. The way that Mallory is coming in, uh, sort of really near the end of the of the courtly love tradition, um, and relating himself to it in some interesting ways, especially as we saw with Lancelot. Uh, we see Chaucer, you know, he's earlier, of course, than Mallory, a couple generations earlier, but he's. Um, uh, so he's kind of closer to it, but we see him really kind of thinking about the whole, this whole love thing, uh, and we can see how that is is uh, uh, sort of changing and growing. So anyway, don't want to digress too much on Chaucer, though that's a certainly a fun thing to talk about, um, but uh, did want to direct your attention to this. So, all right. Yes, exactly. We're celebrating the death day of Chaucer. That's exactly it, just like the ghosts. All right. So speaking of love things, tonight is the love class, right? We did a, a lot of the, the Gareth proving himself, right? Uh, you know, there was a, a big emphasis on being approved uh, knight, um, uh, sort of showing himself to be approved knight, proving himself as a knight, um, which he's done. And now we have the culmination, right? He's trying to, he's coming to rescue the lady. Now what does he do, right? Okay, Gareth, you've... You've rescued the lady. <laughs> okay. What, what comes next? Uh, and wild hijinks ensue. Um, all right. So, but for, we didn't get quite through up to the meeting of the lady. So I'm going to do, at the beginning here, especially, I'm going to do these a little bit out of order um, because I want to, I want to save the, 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 the love stuff sort of for the middle here. Um, so first I want to look at some of the highlights of the, the end of his sort of nightly quest, his, his sort of more, uh, more martial end of, of, of things. You'll remember that the very last slide that we did last time, if I'm remembering correctly, was uh, the... Uh, when uh, the damsel, uh, uh, Lynette, finally uh, admitted, like finally came clean, right? Finally admitted that she was just fronting the whole time, right? That she did not, in fact, despise him, but that she was, she has been testing him, right? And, and turns around and tries to argue, you know, tries to not get him to go charging off. And this is right before his combat with Sir Persant of Ind, right? The Blue Knight. 
And so anyway, their conversation goes on here. Um, his his own perspective on this whole situation with the uh, uh, the very rude damsel who has been calling him a ladle washer and a bowdy kitchen canava all the way through. Um, she says, Ah, Jesu, marvile have I, said the damsel. What manner of man ye be? For it may never be other, but that ye come of gentle blood. For so foul and shamefully doth never woman revile a knecht as I have done you, and ever courteously you have suffered me, and that come never but of gentle blood. Damsel, said Balmanus, a knecht may little do, that may not suffer a gentlewoman, for whatsoever ye said unto me, I took none heed to your wordes. For the more ye said, the more ye angered me. And wrath I raked upon them that I had to do withal. And therefore all the missaying that ye missaid me in my battile furthered me much, and caused me to think to show and prove myself at the end what I was. For peradventure, though it list me to be fed in King Arthur's court, I meeked have had meat in other places. But I did hit for to prove my friend is, and that I shall be known another die, whether that I be gentleman born or none. For I lack you wheat, fair damsel, I have done you gentleman a service, and paraventure better service ye yet will I do, or I depart from you. Alas, she sighed, fair Bominus, forgive me all that I have missaid or done against you. With all my will, said he, I forgive it you, for ye did nothing but as ye should do, for all your evil worders pleased me. Damsel, said Bominus, sin hit liketh you to say thus fair unto me. What ye will, hit gladdeth mine heart greatly, and now meseemeth there is no knicked living, but I am abelly no for him. Okay. So, first, um, Exactly, Karita. It's nice to learn that she's not a monster, right? I mean, she seemed just absolutely horrible. And she is, in fact, not only kind of reversing that and saying, all right, you know, I was doing all this on purpose and I just really can't believe how well you took all this, right? This shows that you're obviously of gentle blood. His explanation of, um, you know, sort of his perspective on the whole thing, I find really interesting. And there's kind of three interesting bits here, right? First, um, what, whatsoever, uh, the more ye said, the more ye angered me, right? So he, he says, no, 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 you have driven me to prove myself again and again and again, right? Since the whole time he has been not only having to endure her verbal abuse of him personally, just like on an interpersonal level, right, having to endure it, but you'll remember she's been slandering him everywhere he went, not only in advance, Right. Not only just saying to like the people that they meet. Yeah, this guy is just a, a kitchen canava. Right. Who's dressed up in knight's clothes. He's a fake. Um, uh, don't respect him. But even afterwards, she's been undermining uh, again to use Mal one of Mallory's favorite words. She's been undermining the worship that he should have gotten from what he already did, right? By saying that he did it all by unhap, right? You know, he, you know, he, he managed to, yes, he managed to kill these other knights, but it, you know, he didn't really deserve any credit for that, right? Um, he should have been building worship, and instead, she's been undermining his. She's been disworshiping him. Footnote: I was noticing a couple times um, in today's reading that um, Maori has taken, I don't remember him doing this as much earlier in the uh, book, um, but he's taken more and more to using the word worship as a noun, or verb rather, using the word worship as a verb. Um, like she worshiped him, um, uh, or like he worshiped Arthur. That doesn't mean what you think it means, or rather it doesn't mean what it sounds like it should mean, not how we use the word worship in the modern sense, right? If you worship somebody, in Maori sense, it means you bring worship to that person, right? So um, you have greatly worshipped me uh, means you have enabled me to gain much worship, right? Um, so all of these, uh, you know, the, the, the Knights of the Round Table worship Arthur in the sense of bringing great worship to the Arthurian court. Um, and similarly, if you disworship somebody, it means you are detracting from their worship, right? From their, from their reputation, um, so anyway, um, that's, um, that's, that's exactly, 
I just want I just wanted to clarify that. Um, you know, there's it's not about idolatry here. Like, you know, no one is uh, uh, no one is like setting up an altar and worshiping somebody else um, in that. It's just not what the word uh, means in that in that context. Anyway. OK. End footnote. Uh, but where was. I? OK, right. So as I was emphasizing last time, Gareth is not only willing, he is eager to prove himself. And so he says, in retrospect, all this abuse and disworship that you have been heaping upon me has been good for me, right? And I have been grateful for it because it has ultimately led to the increase of my worship because it has driven me harder and harder to prove myself even harder than I might have done otherwise. And then notice he segues from that to an explanation of why he did what he did at Arthur's court, right? Um, uh, so let's see, uh, um, right. Uh, per adventure, uh, though it list me, right. Though I desired to be fed in King Arthur's court, I might've had meat elsewhere. Right? I might've had meat in other places. It wasn't about the food, right? Why did he choose to do, why did he go to Arthur's court? Why did he go to Arthur's court? Um, and, um, uh, uh, and not claim his rank, not, not only not reveal himself, right? Because if he'd revealed, he's Arthur's nephew for crying out loud, right? He would have been given great respect and worship had he come to the court that way. Instead, he conceals his identity and he just asks for handouts, right? To be fed for like he's a beggar, like he's a peasant beggar, right? And of course, he's treated like a peasant, um, like one of the laboratories uh, by Kay, as we talked about before. Why? Why did he do this? And he explains straight out why he did this. Um, he says, uh, I did it for to prove my friendes, and that shall be knowen another die, whether that I be a gentleman born or non. Right? So, first, he did it to prove his friends. Right? Um, he did it to prove his friends. Uh, that's... Um, so you remember the emphasis. There were only two knights who were really good to him, right? Gawain and Lancelot. But of course, Gawain was doing it because his blood instinctively drew him towards Beaumains, right? Whereas um, Lancelot, out of his pure generosity of spirit, uh, was being good to him. Right. And of course, we saw him, Gareth, really cleaving to Lancelot, right? Choosing Lancelot as like his mentor, right? Lancelot is his hero. It's Lancelot that he wanted to knight him. Uh, and, uh, you know, and that's one of the, of course, one of the favors that he asks is that Lancelot should should knight him. Notice he's not, um, he is not worried about his own status, about establishing his own status, right? Um it shall be Kno and another die, whether that I be a gentleman born or none, right? That's going to be, that's going to be proved. It's going to be handled. He's not worried about whether or not, you know, there are going to be question marks about that in the future, right? He could afford, he knows he's the son of a king and the nephew of Arthur. He's, his birth is not an issue, right? Um, he, uh, but he wanted to take the opportunity to prove his own friends and to prove himself. Honestly, it's like Sir Gareth is such a is is I mean, he's a fourth child, right? He was the fourth son anyway. We don't know really, I don't think we know if they have any sisters. I don't think they do. Um but anyway, he's the fourth son, right? Um you got to wonder if that's sort of part of it too. Again, he's wanting to prove himself, to show himself on his own. Now, you know, Younger sons is, are able to, you know, able to establish their reputations in Arthur's court. We will see that happen. Um, one of the most famous younger sons, of course, that we're going to see is Sir Percival. Sir Percival is a younger son. And what's more, he's the younger son of a super famous older brother, right? Sir Lamorak uh, is his older brother. And Sir Lamorak, as we're going to see in just a couple slides, is like way up the charts. I mean, he's top three. Um He's almost always named third after Lancelot and Tristram. Lamorak is, is, is uh, I mean, he's the bomb. Um, and Percival is his younger brother. But, of course, Sir Percival is going to come to the fore uh, later on. So it's not like you're always going to be in the shadow of your famous brother. But, of course, if he were to come, if he were to have come to the court and being like, hey, I'm Sir Gareth, Sir Gawain's younger brother, you know, nephew of King Arthur, he would have been accepted. He would have been honored. But it all would have been... 
not his own worship, right? He would not have established his own worship. Um, he would only be uh, honored for who his relations were, right? Um, he's established and he's proved himself on his own terms, not just without the advantage of his connections, but despite, right? Despite being suspected of being not even a gentleman born at all, right? That's what he wanted. That's what he, that's what he chose. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, let's see. David Atlee says, I understand that Bode Mains wanted Lancelot to knight him because of Lancelot's greatness, not because of his kindness. Well, yeah, sure. Right. I mean, it's not like it was only his kindness that inspired him. I mean, he, he, he does like, you know, respect Lancelot as the greatest knight, but his kindness is a big part of that too. Remember, he, he was proving who his friends were. In a sense, what, remember... And uh, David, this is where I think this becomes really important. Remember uh, Lan the precedence that Lancelot was establishing, right? Remember Lancelot establishing this kind of new brand of knighthood. He's not just doing things better the way that other knights were doing them. He's really kind of establishing a new moral level of responsibility for knighthood, new, a new moral ideal. Therefore, his sort of natural and spontaneous generosity towards Beaumains, um, the possibly peasant kid, right, um, is a part of his greatness or, or a, a sign of his greatness. Um, it's, um, it's not, in this way, it's not really just like a, separ a totally separate thing. If you see what I mean, exactly. Lancelot is kind because he is great. That's um, it's one of the ways that you can see that he is really above and beyond um, other knights. It's not just about his prowess in battle, because at the end of the day, that's what the ranking is about. Right. It's about, you know, like how many people can you take down in combat? So if you're, you know, if you're good with a lance and you're good with a sword, you're a great knight. Right. Lancelot shows in Lancelot's kind of doctrine, there's more to being a great knight than just being great with a spear and great with a sword. Now, he is great with a spear and great with a sword, which is handy, right? So, um, you know, being a, just being a clean living knight and not being the greatest of all knights is not everything, right? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of tough. But remember, his doctrine is that the two things are connected, right? If you live well, you'll succeed better. Um, and if you don't, then you're going to be thwarted by unhappiness, right? Um, uh, yeah. So, anyway, um, yeah, yeah. Um, Stephen, there is a kind of parallel between what Gareth does and uh, Strider not telling the hobbits who he is right away, hoping they'll take him for himself. Yeah. Having just spent like four weeks talking about that scene, that conversation between Frodo and Strider, I totally don't want to open that particular box right now and do a close comparison. But let me say that would be interesting, right? It would be interesting to do. Um, yeah. So now why does the damsel reveal her intent here is a really good question. Um, the uh, what she what she has just said previous to this is he's. They've just been leading up to Sir Person to the end. They've just been like following in exactly the same pattern where she's dissing him. And he's like, well, I'm going to go. You know, she's like, oh, you'd better not go forward, you kitchen canava. Right. Like this knight is going to totally mop the floor with you. And he's like, oh, yeah, well, I'm going to do it. You just watch. And then he goes. Right. That's what they've been doing all the way through. There are there they, that she starts that. Right. She initiates that with um, uh, with uh, um before Sir Person of End. Um, and then he starts to be like, oh yeah, I'm going to do it. And, this, and now she draws back. And what seems to make her draw back is that she is, um, uh, she's afraid he's going to die, right? He's tired. He's recently fought. He's injured, right? Um, and he's going to go up against Sir Person of End. She, you know, so he's shown his willingness to do it. And now she's going to try to stop him from going forward with it. Um, because it seems at the end of the day, she really doesn't want him to die. Uh, and they're, they're so close. Like, it's only Sir Person of End. And then, uh, you know, if he gets past Sir Person of End, the Red Knight of the Red Lawns is right over there, right? So, um, 
Uh, they're only like they're like less than 10 miles away from where, uh, you know, her sister is besieged. Um, so anyway, um, that seems to be why she relents. It's like her point has been proven. Um, the fact that he's willing to go up again, tired, uh, wounded as he is against Sir Person of Ind. She's like, OK, OK. All right. All right. I'm convinced. <laughs> right? I'm convinced you really are. Um You've not just been faking it. You've proven yourself, essentially. Right. Um, and it's interesting to me, Rachel, that she that happens not at the not before the final confrontation. Right. But before the penultimate confrontation, before Sir Person to Fiend, not before the Red Knight with the Red Lawns. Um, that, yeah, she does. And, and it's one of the things I think, by the way, it that for me really um, effectively builds up um, the confrontation with Sir Person of Inn, right? It shows that he's a really big deal, which in turn makes the Red Knight, uh, you know, Sir Ironside, uh, the Red Knight of the Red Knight. I love it when he's like, and my real name is Sir Ironside. And I'm like, seriously? Is that what your mom named you? Uh, okay. I, I don't know if I want to hear that story. But um, anyway, uh, again, it, it, it makes that even uh, um, even bigger, really. In a way. Um, okay. Let's see. And, and, oh, and I love his turn at the end, right? Um, when she asks for forgiveness for all that she has mis, uh, missaid or done against him. Uh, and he says, I forgive it you for ye did nothing but as ye shall do. For all your evil word is please at me. Damazel sin hit liketh you to say thus fire unto me, what ye will hit gladdeth mine heart greatly. And now meseemeth there is no knick living, but I am abelly no for him. Right? You inspired me with wrath when you were dissing me before. Right? When you were misspeaking against me, um, you made me angry, and I took out my wrath on. I I, I wreaked my wrath upon my opponents. Right? So you helped me. In the end, right? You increased my desire to prove myself. Now, by being kind, you've inspired me even more. So, uh, and I just, uh, I, I really, um, uh, I really like that, uh, that turn that he gives to it, right? So one way or the other, whether she's speaking ill of him or whether she's speaking uh, kindly to him, she's helping, right? Uh, and that's, uh, um, that's really that's really cool. That's really cool. Um, soon after this, she reveals who she is and who her lady is. Remember, it's just been she's just the damsel all this time. And her lady is just her lady. Right. There's just this lady. Right. That she's coming to. Um, Sir Person of Ind asks her fire damsel, said Sir Persound. Wother watered are ye away, lading this knicht? Sir, she sighed, this knicht is going to the castle dangerous, whereas my sister is besieged. Aha, said Sir Persant. That is the knicht of the Red Lount, which is the most perilous knicht that I knew now living, and a man that is withouten mercy, and men sigh that he hath seven men his strength. God save you, Sir Bominas, from that knicht, for he doth great wrong to that laddie, and that is great pity, for she is one of the fairest laddies of the world, and meseemeth that your damsel is her sister. Is not your name Leonette? Sir, so I hicked, and my laddie, my sister, hicked Dame Leonesse. Now shall I tell you, said Sir Persant, this reed knicht of the reed lounders hath lain long at that siege, well nigh this tall years, and many time as he meeked have had her, and he walled, but he prolongeth the time to this intent, for to have Sir Launcelot du Lac to do battle with him, or with Sir Tristram's, or other Sir Lamorac de Gales, other Sir Gawain, and this is his tarrying so long at the siege. Now, my lord, said Sir Persant of Ind, be ye strong and of good heart, for ye shall have ado with a good knight. Let me deal, said Sir Bominus. Let me deal. Again, I just, I love that phrase. Um, Wother Ward. Isn't that a great word, Tarlonio? I, you gotta love that, right? Um, so, Sir Persant recognizes her, and she reveals both her name, 
her identity, her connection with her lady and her sister's name all at once, right? Now everything, um, now that kind of the veil has been pulled back, really, as soon as she stops being harsh with him and begins being kind with him, now all of a sudden they're on a completely different level, right? She reveals, her own name is revealed and she doesn't mind. She's uh, uh, Leonette, her sister is uh, Leoness, and um, uh, yeah, and again, they're siblings. This is that she's been doing all this for. Now, the other thing, of course, that we learn is the Red Knight of the Red Lawns. There are two things that we learn about him here. On the one hand, he is um, he is definitely not... He has laid claim to the lady. He is besieging Leoness. But as Sir Person said, he could have had her several times. Like, he's laying siege to her castle, but... He could have taken the castle if he had wanted to, um, but he doesn't seem to have chosen to do that, right? He uh, um, is holding out. He's doing his siege thing in order to induce somebody to come and fight him. Now, specifically, we're told he would like to have Sir Lancelot do battle with him, or maybe Sir Tristram, or maybe Sir Lamorak, or maybe Sir Gawain, right? In other words one of the top-rated knights in the world, right? He really wants to to draw... And this is why he he's he's treating all these... So any other knight who comes and fights him, he does, you know, despicable things too, right? Disworshipful things too. Um, again, in order to induce somebody like Lancelot to come. Remember, this is almost exactly what Sir Tarquin did, um, that he was, he was specifically targeting Lancelot. Uh, the difference being that he had a particular grudge against Sir Lancelot because Sir Lancelot had killed his brother. Right. Whereas here, it kind of seems instead like the Red Knight of the Red Lawns is really just kind of um, working, uh, working towards, I don't know, moving up the rankings, you know, really wants to challenge them to come and uh, to come and attack him, though it's not quite sure exactly why. Um, now, Karita, you had asked the question just a little while back. Um, I don't know what's up with the colors exactly or that is to say if there's a symbolism to it it's possible I, it doesn't totally set off my allegory alarm right i mean when i'm reading medieval literature there 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 will be things that will happen that'll make me twitch that i'm like oh wait hang on you know um allegory alert the colors, it's possible. It's possible. But it doesn't feel allegorical to me. Um, they're too... They and their encounters are too similar. And the interactions that they have with him afterwards are too cookie cutter, right? They all resolve themselves the same way. If they were, you know... If this were like an allegory of like the sort of spiritual progress, like Gareth as sort of every man fighting against, you know, vices or something like that. That would be a, a, a natural kind of allegory to do. Um, it would, uh, it would feel different than this. Like there would be, there's nothing to mark, like apart from the color, what does the Green Knight stand for? I mean, is there anything that he does or says that really distinguishes him from the Red Knight, his brother? I don't see it apart from the fact that the Red Knight has more, men at arms at his disposal, right? But that's just a clear escalation from the Black Knight to the Green Knight to the Red Knight to the Blue Knight to the other Red Knight, right? And each one brings with him a greater army so that at the end, Gareth is like a king, right? They all swear fealty to Gareth. He has all of these subject knights. Gareth now personally can call like a thousand knights to the battlefield um, on his side. That's kind of, you know, that probably puts Sir Gareth on the level of some of those... Uh, 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 of those 11 kings, right, back that were fighting against Arthur way back when, right? Um, I mean, Sir Gareth is, uh, is definitely moving up here, but that's kind of, that's kind of the way that it sounds like to me, rather than having them have an allegorical significance. Um, it's, it's a little bit, it's a little bit like uh, moving up in karate ranks, Stephen. Just, just a tiny bit. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't, I, there may be, 
uh, curate as some sort of really clever schema that could be come up with. But but again, I don't I don't see it. Um, and if I could indulge, and I'll try to do this very briefly in a sideline. Um, it's you can always allegorize things, and of course, in medieval literature, there are many people who do and like to do that. So I mean, so for instance, you can find lots of precedents for particular colors being connected with certain things, right? Um, so like, for instance, the color blue often associated with the virtue of hope, right? And so if armed with that piece of information, right, with that like factoid, you could then go to Sir Person to Vind and be like, ah, Sir Person to Vind represents like his hope for the, you know, whatever. Like you can do that, you know, and if you're clever, you can make it work. If you're clever, you can make anything work. Um, but and there are some people who really like doing that, who really will kind of seize upon like colors or numbers or some other sort of schema and say like, you know, if you start off with saying, OK, this is obviously symbolic and two, this is the symbolic schema, colors, numbers, whatever it is. Um, yeah, again, yeah, you can apply it and you can make it work, but I'm not convinced. It doesn't it doesn't it doesn't feel like that to me. Um, yeah. Um, OK, cool. Um, More on that leaderboard. This is again uh, Sir Person of End speaking. Um, he uh, d d sort of charmingly, he offers to knight Sir Gareth before he heads off to fight the Red Knight of the Red Lawn. So this is after he's already beaten Sir Person, right? So he's beaten all five of the chromatic brothers, right? Four. Black, green, red, blue. Yes, four. He's beaten all four, killed one, beaten all four uh, of the chromatic brothers now. Um, and so he's, you know, uh, Sir Persant is, uh, has great respect, right, uh, for Gareth. But as far as he knows, he's not even a knight, right? There's been this question about is he a kitchen canava or not. Now, all of the chromatic brothers, after they're beaten, say, like, dude, this guy is um, clearly... He's a he's a gentleman, right? There's no, uh, you know, this guy is not really just a kitchen canava, um, and yet there's been some doubt. There's been some. Qu he's proven himself, Sir Person. Not sure if he's been knighted yet, so he offers to do it, right? And that's a super humble thing for Sir Person to do, to acknowledge, you know, to sort of be like, okay, I just got beat. I and my whole family just got whooped by a squire, essentially, right? I mean, it's a little embarrassing, but he does it, and. Sir Gareth's like, no, it's okay. I'm good, right? I'm, uh, uh, I'm, uh, uh, I was knighted by Sir Lancelot. Ah, said Sir Persant, of a more renowned man, make ye not be made knight of. For all knightes, for of all knightes, he might be called chief of knighthood. And so all the world saith that betwixt three knightes is departed clearly knighthood, and that is Sir Lancelot du Lac. Sir Tristram's de Lyonnais and Sir Lamarack de Gallus. These bear now the renown, yet there be many other noble connectors, as Sir Palamides the Saracen and Sir Saphir his brother, also Sir Bleobris and Sir Blamor of Gan de Ganis, his brother, also Sir Boris de Ganis and Sir Hector de Maris, and Sir Percival de Gallus, that's Lamarack's younger brother. These and many more be noble connectors, but there be none that bear the name but these three above and said. Therefore, God speed you well, said Sir Persaunt, for and ye may match that red knight, ye shall be called the fourth of the world. All right, so if you can beat Sir Ironsides, you will shoot right up the leaderboards and you'll be situated right under Sir Lamarack uh, and above Sir Palamides, the Saracen. By the way, notice who doesn't make this list? Who's not on the list? Exactly. Yeah, Tarlonio K is not on the list, and Gawain's not on the list. Now, David Galahad isn't on the list for a good reason, and that's that he's not been born yet. So that's not his fault. Um, uh, he's uh, he's not even a fetus. He's still an egg. Uh, I think his mom's around, but he's not yet. Um, uh, so um, yeah, th th that's not his fault. Uh, but yeah, Gaw Gawain gets no love, right? Gawain gets no love. He has a big reputation especially because he's Arthur's nephew. Um, but he is not listed by Sir Persaunt 
as uh, really one of the top. How many people does he name here? I forgot to count. Uh, one, two, the top three, of course, and then uh, Palamides and Safir and Bleabaris and Blamor and Bors and Ector and Sir Percival. He lists the top ten, right? Um, so Gawain doesn't make the top ten. I guess if uh, Sir Gareth beats Sir Ironsides, then he's going to, um, um, uh, then he's gonna, he's gonna probably bump Sir Percival off the list, right? This is one of the clearest kinds of. Exa- I mean, I, I I I keep joking about the sort of the ranking system that they have and stuff, but you can see it's like accept it, um, and you can see also how people move up and down it. Now, one of the things that's really interesting here, the Red Knight of the Red Lawns isn't on this list, and yet beating him is going to catapult Gareth up. So there seems to be like two different kinds of categories of knights, right? Like, so Sir Tarquin, nobody was going around being like, oh, Sir Tarquin is one of the top knights of the world, even though people were saying he is the, like, the strongest knight, perhaps, except for Sir Lancelot. Nobody included him in rankings, right? Nobody talked like that. Um, uh, nobody talked... Oh, uh, David says, are we surprised that King Pelinor didn't make it? A little bit, but Pelinor's a little long in the tooth now. We're in the next generation here. Um, uh, 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 Sir Lamorak is his son. And Sir Percival, uh, so uh, uh, like his legitimate son, not his bastard son like Sir Tor. Um, so uh, yeah, Sir King King Pellinor, just like Ulfius and Brastius and all, they've uh, they've kind of uh, they're in, in at least semi-retirement at this point, so they're they're, they're no longer ranked. Um, but anyway, we can. So anyway, so what I was saying, the implication here. We often get these antagonist knights, right? Like the Red Knight of the Red Lones is prior to uh, Sir Gareth beating him, um, like Sir Tarquin was before him, and he's not included. But it's it's to me extremely significant that the beat. If he were to come in, if Gareth were to come in and defeat Sir Lamorak, right? That would be huge news. Right, that would be leaderboard leaderboard altering news if Gareth came in and beat Sir Lamorak. Why should it be leaderboard altering news for him to defeat the Red Knight of the Red Lawns if the Red Knight of the Red Lawns is himself not in the top ten? So it seems to me that the the answer uh, to that question is that it's, there are like two lists, or rather, it's not just force of arms that puts you on this list. Again, to come back to this same sort of theme, right? These are all knights who are all good knights. That's one of the things that is, uh, 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 that's being ranked here, right? Notice Lancelot, as the number one knight of the world, is called the chief of knighthood, right? And notice again, between three knights is, is departed clearly Knechtod. Right, so knighthood is divided clearly among three people. They are the flowers of knighthood. So it's not only about their prowess in battle. Personally, I think this is why um, this is why Sir Gawain isn't on the list. Right? Um, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Dever says, this is the list of the famous, the infamous get their own list. In a sense, in a sense. Um, but Rachel, that's exactly the point, I think. Um, the knights need to conduct themselves according to the knightly code. Uh, the Red Knight of the Red Lawns does not count because he is operating outside of the bounds of knighthood. He has disqualified himself, right? He's strong, and people will give him credit for strength, just as they gave Sir Tarquin credit for strength. But although Sir Tarquin was one of the strongest knights in the world, he was not a good knight. Nobody would have called him a good knight. He was a terrible knight. He was an evil knight, right? And that's an interesting kind of thing, isn't it, right? When you say good knight, good knight is also is the opposite of bad knight, but good knight is also the opposite of evil knight, right? Um, both of those things, both the skill in arms and the moral standing are both wrapped up together there. Again, I think that's why Sir Gareth, or Sir Gawain rather, isn't in here. Um, Sir Gawain, I think, I, I think Sir Gawain could take several of these guys. I, 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 again, if it just comes to combat, I, I think I'd take Sir Gawain over uh, uh, Bleoberus and, and Blamor. I'd put him at least number five or six on this list, probably, but he's not on there, right? Um, yeah, so 
Yeah, Dolor Strikes at least doesn't stab people invisibly. Right, Sir Garland's not going to make the list either, right? No matter how many people he stabs while invisible. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Zach, that's interesting. Beating Gawain would likely propel one up the rankings, but Gawain's past deeds don't make him a shining example of knighthood. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's not quite like... You know, that doesn't mean that Gawain is necessarily like on the naughty list. Like he's not on the, the list of bad knights necessarily or evil knights. Um, but uh, but his uh, his standing is 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 damaged by his at best compromised reputation. And if I'm exceptionally efficient in the next hour, we'll get to that uh, at the end. OK, here is uh, Sir Ironside's explanation, the Red Knight of the Red Lawns. Um, Sir Ironside's being easier to say <clears throat> after going after Gareth beats him, right? Um, and he asks for mercy of Gareth. And Gareth says, I might not with my worship to salve thy life for the shameful deaths that thou hast caused to my many full good knictes to die. Sir, said the red knict, hold your hand and ye shall know the causes why I put him to so shameful a death. Say on, said Sir Balminus. Sir, I love it on us a laddie fire, and she had her brethren slain, and she told me it was. Uh, by the way, she did, doesn't mean she she had like she like bumped off her brothers. Uh, you know, she didn't put out a hit on her brothers. It means her brothers were killed. Like she had her brothers killed, right? It was like a bad thing that happened to her. Okay, and she told me it was Sir Launcelot du Lac, other Ellis Sir Gawain, one of the two. And she prayed me, as I loved her heartily, that I would make her a promise by the faith of my knictoad, for to labor in armies daily, until that I had met with one of him, and all that I meeked overcome, I should put them to villain's death. And so I ensured her to do all the villainy unto Arthur's knictis, and that I should tack vengeance upon all these knictis. And, sir, no, I will tell thee that every die my strength increaseth till known, until I have seven manis strength. Just like Gawain, right? Um, this is a thing. I notice he doesn't explain how this happens. Uh, why do you have seven? Like, does your strength increase until noon until you have seven seven men's strength? Just like Gawain, we don't know. The mechanism not explained here at all, right? Um, but um. Uh, anyway, there it is. So, why did he do this? Why did he act villainously? Why did he uh, uh, put all of these knights to a shameful death? Because his lady made him promise to do it. Out of vengeance for the death of her brothers, and in order to goad Lancelot or Gawain into jousting with him. Now, as far as we could see from Sir Person's words before, this was like leaderboard driven, right? He wanted to have a do with Lancelot or Gawain in order to prove himself. And that seems part of the whole theme of the story, right? That the red line, you know, so when, when Gareth being on the make here, right, and trying to prove himself uh, a good knight in every sense of the word, comes finally up against the villain knight, uh, and I'm using villain here in the modern sense, not the medieval sense, um, comes up against the villain knight, uh, who is, uh, again, the, the, the great antagonist of the piece, only to find that he also was trying to prove himself as well, right? Or at least that's what it looked like until he reveals that it wasn't just about proving himself. It was about avenging the brothers of his lady and fulfilling his promise to his lady. Even the ill treatment of knights, even the shameful deaths that he put knights to were in uh, fulfillment of his promise to his lady. Right. Sarah, this does kind of sound like a cue the training montage speech, right? If we were telling the story of Sir Ironsides, I agree. Um, now, Sir Gareth forgives him for doing this, and everybody's kind of willing to cut him slack here, right? He did bad things. But at the end of the day, he's not Sir Turquin, right? He doesn't just... He's not merely bad and abusive for the sake of being bad and abusive. Now, Sir Tarquin was avenging his own brother, right? Um, but he was doing what he was doing out of his own motivation. Um, Sir Ironsides is doing it 
to please his lady. Thus proving two things, right? First, if you do bad things for love, people are willing to cut you slack for that in this world, right? Oh, you just did it because a lady asked you to do it? Okay, all right, maybe you're not uh, really horrible, right? Um, exactly, uh, David Adley. He isn't sadistic, he's just misled, right? But of course, it also shows us simultaneously a second thing, which is that love can get you into some pretty serious trouble, right? Like, if you're not careful, you can end up the antagonist knight who's like stringing uh, good knights up on trees and hanging them shamefully and stuff and murdering folks, right? I mean, that's that's not good. Um, but but it changes the story, right? It's no longer a Sir Ironside story. It's a love story. That is to say, it's not a story about what a shameful, horrible person Sir Ironside's was. It's a story about the kinds of things that love can drive you to. It's a cautionary tale, right? But the kind of villain of the piece, in a sense, is not the guy himself, he is sort of has been ensnared in this situation. Now, understand, by saying he has been ensnared, I'm not blaming the woman right now. Her choices, I think, were not good either. Uh, but I don't mean he's been ensnared by a woman and that it's all the woman's fault. I'm saying I'm talking about love. And we're going to look at uh, we're, we're going to see lots of examples uh, of ensnaring uh, uh, by love. Exactly. Love is the villain. Love is the villain of this of this piece. Um, one of the things that we see from Sir Ironside's confession is. Careful, y'all. Love is dangerous. Right. And, and, you know, not just I mean, everyone would agree that love is dangerous in the sense that it like it can lead you to a horrible death, like you trying to prove yourself or or that it causes you terrible suffering. Everybody knows love causes you terrible suffering and that can be fatal. Right. You can die of love. Totally happens. Um but at the same time, um, that's it's not just that, right? Love can corrupt you. Um, uh, and but if you follow in the path of love, you could end up, right, um, engaging in shameful actions like this. Um, love is perilous. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, Josiah, that's a really good point. Um, there is no obvious censure of Sir Ironside's lady right now. We don't know. Maybe Josiah, it's because that would be sort of, that's another story, right? Maybe the ladies of the court, like Guinevere and the ladies might censure her and be like, oh man, like setting up a knight as a, as an antagonist knight, like, and telling him, like making him promise to put other knights shamefully to death. That is so not done, right? Maybe there would be some kind of internal discipline from the lady side of things. And we don't really know. And we don't, we don't usually have access to what is going on behind closed doors in the ladies' side uh, of the courtly love experience. Um, but uh, it, it's, but Josiah, you are right. Nobody's response to this is like, "What a horrible, wicked woman!" Right? You have been like, uh, you know, deceived and uh, and um, uh, you know, appallingly, uh, uh, you know, corrupted by this terrible woman. Um, I agree. I think it's important that we don't, it's important to note that we do not see that here anyway, but let's talk some more about Sir Gareth in love. So, uh, one of the bits I skipped is Sir Persant and his daughter. Okay, so after Sir Persant has been defeated by Sir Gareth, he invites him back to his tents, right? He's in tents with his, he's like camped there with his men at arms, right, in the field. And uh, he invites him back to his, uh, uh, to his pavilion. And so they went unto Sir Persant's pavilion and drank wine, drank wine and eat spices. And afterward, Sir Persant made him to rest upon a bed until supper time. And after supper, 
to bed again, to bed again. So once Sir Beaumains was a bed, Sir Persant had a doctor, a fair laddie of eighteen year of age, and there he called here unto him and charged here and commanded here upon his blessing to go unto the Canicte's bed. Wait, she's supposed to go to his bed? Wait, does, does that mean, oh, hang on, he's going to explain. And lie down by his side and mock him no strange cheer, but good cheer, and tuck him in your armies and kiss him and look that this be done, I charge you, and ye will have my love and my good will. Okay, so that's unusual hospitality, right? Uh, f- uh, okay. Um, oh, by the way, yeah, so they, they ate spices, yeah. I, probably not neat, right? They probably, yeah, weren't just like taking spoonfuls of, you know, nutmeg or whatever. Um, uh, probably not. Um, yeah. Um, so, okay. Um, I have... Uh, <laughs> a couple of people say they've never had this experience when visiting strangers. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so... I really like uh, once... Uh, a friend and uh, colleague of mine, uh, 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 Thomas Hanks, uh, g- wonderful medievalist and Ma- Maori guy uh, from Baylor University, um, uh, was once giving a uh, giving a talk uh, that I invited him to, and he he was talking about the the Book of Sir Gareth, uh, and when he was talking about this scene, he says, uh, "You may have heard the story of the princess and the pea." This is a variant. He says, I really like that. So, um, David Attlee is wondering if this is Sir Persound trying to get rid of an inconvenient unmarried daughter. It is possible, but there is no obvious marriage outcome here. Um, I mean, there's just really not. Um, I agree with Professor Hanks that um, this is this is a Gareth story. It's not a Sir Persant of Ind story, right? Um, I don't think since this daughter just sort of shows up conveniently and then leaves afterwards. Um, the important thing here is how Percival acts towards her. I think if we spend too much time trying to think through what Sir Persant is thinking in doing this and why he, um, um, uh, why he, um, you know, gives his, you know, gives his daughter this quite unusual, uh, sort of command. Um, I, I, I think we're missing the point. I think we're missing the point if we are just, if we're trying to think this through, again, it's not a novel. Right. It's not a modern novel with the same kind of modern assumptions. I just there's no gesture at explaining Sir Person's behavior. Is it unusual? Yeah. Dads don't generally act this way um, uh, with their 18 year old daughters. It's just not normal. Um, And um, yeah, make him no strange cheer would just literally mean don't play hard to get. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's he is making it as ex- he's being as blunt as he can without losing his own uh, like PG thirteen rating, <laughs> right? Um, uh, it's almost like he's worried that his daughter might misunderstand him or afraid that she's gonna like try to um, try to uh, uh, like get off on a technicality or something, right? Um, he makes everything really clear, right? Um, uh, lie down by his side. Don't play hard to get. Right? Take him in your arms and kiss him. Uh, and then he seems to sort of believe that probably Sir Gareth will take it from there, 
right? He doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't give her any further instructions after the lying down next to him and kissing him thing. Um, so Persaunt, Sir Persauntus's daughter did as, his, as her father bade her, and so she yode unto Sir Bomina's bed, and privily she despoiled here. That means she took her clothes off and laid her down by him. And then he awoke and saw her and asked her what she was. Sir, she sighed, I am Sir Persauntus's doctor, that by the commandment of my father I am come hither. Be ye a pussel or a wife? Pussel is a, is a, means a maiden, a virgin. Sir, she sighed, I am a clean maiden. God defend me, sighed he, that ever I should defoil you to do Sir Persauntus such a shama. Therefore, I pray you, fair damsel, arise out of this bed, other else I will. Sir, she sighed, I come not hither by mine own will, but as I was commanded. Alas, said Sir Bominus, I were a shamful knight, and I will do your father any disworship. But so he kissed her, and she departed, and come unto Sir Persaunt, her father, and told him all how she had sped. Truly, sighed Sir Persaunt, whatsoever he be, he is come of full noble blood. And so we leave him, leave him there, till on the morn. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> exactly. She's like, look, I'm not here because I want to be here. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, David, I do think, to me, the most charming moment of this entire scene is the kiss, right? Um, I come not hither by mine own will, but as I was commanded, right? Uh, it says, alas, I were a shameful connect, right? I, no way, no way I'm doing this, right? But so he kissed her, and so she departed. So what does the kiss mean? It means she's fulfilled her father's commandment, right? She has done absolutely everything that her father told her to do. So on the one hand, he's like making sure that the damsel doesn't get in trouble, making it clear that um, this whole thing, it's the reason this whole thing didn't come off is not because she was disobedient, right? He wants to make that perfectly clear. And I also suspect that, um, I also suspect that he's being kind to her personally, right? You know, like he's, he kisses her and he's like, it's not you, it's me, right? I mean, I, it's not that I'm not into you or anything. Like, really, really, it's not about that. It's just that, you know, no, no, I, I uh, don't feel bad, but no. Um, so um, anyway, he passes the test. Um, you'll see why Professor Hanks called this uh, like the princess and the pea, right? I mean, it's 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 a test of of noble blood. Um, only someone of noble blood would have acted this way, according to Sir Persaunt, right? Um, however, we've seen some examples of knights of noble blood who might not have passed this particular test. I think, right? I mean, come on. Uh, you think King Pelinor would have passed this test? I'm not sure Sir Gawain would have passed this test. I feel kind of certain Sir Gawain would not have uh, uh, would not have passed this test. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Carita, it is at the very least. It is or, or Arthur Tolonio, an excellent point. Yeah, yeah, um, um, yeah. Um, <laughs> exactly. Katriana, I totally agree with you. Um, I think that Gawain would have been like jackpot. Like, this is this, I should come here more often, right? Yeah. No, exactly. Um, his Gareth's response. His again, we can see how countercultural it is for Sir Person to do this to his daughter, right? We can see by Gareth's reaction. Oh, well, this would have been terrible disworship to my host, right? Uh, to defoil his daughter um, while I am his guest, even under these circumstances, by his own command. He, he, he would be a shameful knight if he acted that way. Um, and yes, David, I agree. Uh, noble blood is necessary, but not sufficient, uh, perhaps, to the passing of this, uh, um, of this test. And Brian, you're absolutely right. The ability to resist sexual temptation 
uh, has not been conspicuous among the nobility that we have seen uh, in this book so far. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. David Erbach and uh, uh, Dolores Stroke were also remembering uh, the uh, temptations in Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, uh, which are kind of uh, uh, parallel in this way. So, yeah, yeah, no, I... Uh, um, I hear that. I know what you mean. Um, yeah. Anyhow, at the very least, Carita, I think we have to understand if 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 we're given any way of understand the. Or let me say this even more forcefully: the only angle we are given on Sir Persaunt's thinking here is that he is willing to make a high stakes gamble in order to test Sir Gareth. Now, two things. First of all, remember. All of the Chromatic Brothers were very much in Gareth's corner after he beat them, right? As far as they are concerned, he has proven that he is uh, a good knight and clearly a gentleman, right? Clearly a native member of the fighting class based upon how well he has fought. So they all believe in him, and the Green Knight and the, and the Red Knight, both of them, have been speaking against Lynette, the damsel, right? Lynette, when she's uh, when she was dissing uh, 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 Gareth, right? Um, saying, no, 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 clearly, clearly he's a gentleman. Um, Sir Persant has, has said the same thing, right? Clearly respects Sir Gareth, but still tests him. Does this further test, right? Um, okay, he's a he's good. He's a good knight. He's a, an effective knight. Uh, he's good in he's good in the field, which so probably he's a gentleman because of how well he fights. Again, that's what gentlemen do. Remember, um, but he wants to make this final test to test not only his prowess in battle but his virtue, and he passes. And you know, as I suggest in my in my uh, uh, my subtitle here, he shows that he is Lancelot's true disciple, right? This is, he is following the Lancelot school of knighthood here. What? Take a lady paramours? No, I will have nothing of it, right? Um, that is not how we disciples of Lancelot roll, right? Um, uh, that leads to all unhappiness, right? If you do that kind of thing. Um, he's appalled by this. With that in mind, we come to his meet to the meeting with his lady. Um, now this is again, this is still actually during the, uh, the, the build up to the fight. He's not yet fought the red knight of the red lawns, right? He's just sort of shown up and there's the red knight of the red lawns and there's the, te- the, the castle over there, uh, with lady Leoness looking out of it. Right. Um, Sir, sighed the damsel Lynette unto Sir Beaumines. Look ye be glad and licked, for yonder is your deadly enemy, and at yonder window is my laddie, my sister, Dame Lyonesse. Where? sighed Beaumines. Yonder, sighed the damsel, and pointed with her finger. I love that. Yonder. That is truth, sighed Beaumines. She beseemeth afar the firest laddie that ever I looked upon, and truly, he sighed, I ask no better quarrel than now for to do battle, for truly she shall be my laddie, and for here will I fict. Okay, so Gareth has seen her from a distance of, I don't know, what, a hundred yards, maybe, at best, right? She's across the field and up in the, and he sees her at the window and he's like, she beseemeth Afar, the fire is like, from here, she looks like the fairest lady that I ever looked upon, right? And immediately he's like, boom, she shall be my lady and for her will I fight, right? I, I, she, she's the one, right? She's the one. And ever he looked up to the window with glad countenance. And this laddie, Dame Leoness, made courtesy to him down to the earth, holding up both her hondas. With that, the red knecht called unto Beaumines and said, Sir knecht, leave thy beholding and look on me. I consile thee, for I warn thee well, she is my laddie, and for here I have done many strong battailas. Now, she's his lady in one sense, of course, but as we will learn, not in another. He has not accepted her as her beloved, as his beloved, rather. Um, 
uh, he has uh, he, he has these other lady, right, who put him up to all this in the first place. She's the, the excuse, right? She's the mechanism by which he's fulfilling the wish of his real lady. Um, but, of course, she's the lady, Leoness is the lady that he has claimed, right, so that he can, uh, uh, he can do the things, right? Um, uh, so... <laughs> Dumas says, well, nowadays, some people fall in love through online chatting, so this doesn't seem strange at all. Well, but still, then, he wish you get to know them a little bit, right? He just sees her from a window, and he's like, I think she's probably really beautiful, so uh, I'm going to I'm gonna love her forever. Now, right, uh, Tolonio, exactly, love, of, love at first glimpse is what we get here. Here's where things, I think, get really complex. Um, if I were wanting to write a paper in which I was trying to show what is exactly Maori's relationship with the earlier courtly love tradition, I really think I would want to start with the tale of Sir Gareth here. Um, cause this is like a classic moment. In fact, this is almost, almost like a parody of a classic moment in courtly love uh, poetry, right? The knight who sees the lady uh, from a window in a tower and immediately he's like, I shall love her and only her for as long as I shall live, right? It's like, okay, that's, it's not just typical, that's cliche, right? And a little bit silly, right? And it feels so cliche, it feels almost like a parody, right? When, um, uh, when we get this, so, uh, you know... Uh, he seems to be playing, uh, 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 playing with some of the, these conventions, right? After the battle, right, he comes into the castle and it looks like he ex he's expecting to be welcomed, right? I mean, he just lifted the siege. He just totally beat the Red Knight of the Red Lawns. He's done all these things, right? He's beaten all four of the Chromatic Brothers and then the Red Knight of the Red Lawns. He's done this thing, which they, you know, everybody was like, almost nobody could do this. And he's like, I've totally done this, right? And uh, and here I am and, and, and she's my love. And she was like being nice, you know, from a distance and everything. So this is going to be, this is going to be the moment right? Where uh, everything goes well. And instead, boom. Fire curtes knicht, said Dam Leones. Be not displeased, nother be not over hasty. For weet you well, your great travail, nother your good love, shall not be lost. For I consider your great labor and your hardiness, your bounty and your goodness as me ought to do. But remember, she's told him, you need to wait for a year, right? Hang out. Don't go too far away, but uh, I'll get back to you in a year. And therefore, go on your way, and look that you be of good comfort, for all shall be for your worship, and for the best. And pardi, a twelve-month will soon be done. And trust me, fair knicht, I shall be true to you, and never betray you, but to my death I shall love you, and none other. And therewithal she turned from the window, and Sir Beaumines rode away word from the castle, mocking great dole. And so he rode now here, now there, as he wist not whether, till his till his hit was durk nicht. And than it happened to him to come to a poor man's house, and there he was harboured that all harboured all that knicht. That nicht, no, no not not that knicht, that nicht. <coughs> but Sir Bominus had no rest but wallowed and writhed for the love of the lady of that castle. Okay. Once again, once again, classic, classic examples, right? Classic examples of how the love thing goes. Um, even the, um, even the, uh, the, the pushback by the lady, Right. No, no. You have to prove yourself more. Um, take a year and show that you are one of the worthiest knights of the world and then come see me after that. And then maybe I will consider letting you into the castle. Right. That's kind of a classic move on the part of a courtly love lady. Um, and then look at what he does. He goes and can he sleep? No, he cannot sleep. He is passing a sleepless night, wallowing and writhing. 
for the love of his lady, like you do. Again, I can point you to half a dozen courtly love poems in which the knights are doing exactly this kind of thing, right? Um, this is what this is. These are like diagnosable symptoms. In fact, there are some there are some funny poems that make plays on that, right? They're like, um, is he in love? Well, I don't know. They're like, are you sleeping well? Because uh, uh, if you are sleeping well, you remember Shakespeare plays on this too. And wasn't it As You Like It where we have jokes about this, right? You sleep too well. You're not, you're obviously not in love. Um, is that As You Like It? I think that's As You Like It. Anyway. Um, yeah. So, uh, so right. So this is, uh, I, 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 this is going more or less according to script, not according to Sir Gareth's plans, not how he sort of saw and hoped that this was going to be working out. But nevertheless, uh, this is, this is pretty much, um, um, how we might have expected things to go. Um, yeah, I was right. It was, yeah. Rosalind to Orlando. That's what I thought. Totally. It's been forever since I read As You Like It. I should reread that. But um, but yeah, I, I, I was. Uh, he does a lot, of course, of playing. Uh, Shakespeare does a lot of playing with the conventions of courtly love in that uh, play. Okay. Okay. Then we have the dwarf stealing incident, right? <laughs> Where uh, they apparently, Leonette and Leoness, have a brother, right? Sir Gringamore, who goes off and steals. Gareth's dwarf, uh, and, uh, and runs off and runs back with him because they're going to try to make him tell them who Sir Gareth really is. Cause none of them still know, even Leonette, who's been traveling with him still doesn't know what his proper name is. Um, so they, so they, they steal the dwarf and they bring the dwarf back and we're like, okay, we're, you're here to tell us, uh, you know, they put him like under a light bulb and tie him to a chair and they're like, all right, spill dwarf. What's his name? And the dwarf's like, oh yeah, whatever. I don't mind telling you that. And he tells him the whole thing, right? He's Sir Gareth. He's a brother of Sir Gawain and nephew of Arthur. And it's all cool. Um, and, uh, and then, they, you know, then they're going to let him go. And then Sir Gareth comes back. He's like, give me back my dwarf. Um, but anyway, it's all, it's all, it's then, you know, they give him back the dwarf and it's all, it's all friendly. Right. Um, and he and Sir Gringamore are reconciled. Sir Gringamore apologizes. Right. And, and, uh, um, Sir, um, uh, Sir Gareth is like, okay, like, you know, bygones, uh, and everything. And so Sir Gringamore took him by the hond and led him into the hall where his own wife was. That is Sir Gringamore's own wife. And Thon come forth Dame Lyonnais, arrayed like a princess, and there she mock him passing good cheer, and he here again, and they had goodly language and lovely countenance. Okay, lovely countenance doesn't mean they had pretty faces, right? That means they were making love countenances, right? The, their faces were bespeaking the uh, movement of love that was taking place inside them, right? So these are smoldering glances that Gareth and uh, Leoness are exchanging here uh, uh, during this uh, during this time, right? Now, um, remember, Leoness, he doesn't know that it's her. He doesn't know that she had a brother, right? She doesn't know that this is her brother. Um, so she's been, but she's not been introduced. So she's, oh yeah, this is my sister. And he doesn't recognize her. He does not know that this is Leoness at this point, right? <laughs> Josiah, it is such a good thing that Sir Balin isn't here to help, right? Imagine uh, how much unhap there is the, there, there's the opportunity for during this whole sequence, right? And Sir Balin would have found a way to step in every single one of them. Anyway, okay. And Sir Gareth thought many times, Jesu, would that the lady of this castle perilous were so fire as she is. I really wish that the lady that I love was as beautiful as this woman right here. <laughs> right? Okay, don't say that too loud, Gareth. Um, so, uh, a smooth operator, Gareth is not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, and there, she, there was all manner of gamas and playas of dancing and singing, and evermore Sir Gareth beheld that laddie. <laughs> I bet he did. And the more he looked on her, on her, the more he brenned in love that she that he passed himself far in his reason. Oh dear, he is completely over it, right? He is completely past it now. Uh, he is his 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 rationality is dropping as he is br burning more and more with love. 
for this beautiful lady that he has met and whom he wishes that his love were as beautiful as she. Um, and forth to water is nicked, they yod unto supper, and Sir Gareth meek not eat, for his love was so hot that he wist not where he was. I can't eat any dinner. Torlonio, you remember that's another one of the symptoms that Rosalind and Orlando talk about, right? Um, do you have a good appetite? Oh, okay. If you can't eat, that okay. Again, that's a clear symptom. Clear symptom. Um, yeah, so, David, you are right. We have the uh, potential for tragedy or something like tragedy here. I'm not saying real tragedy. Like, again, he's not Balin, right? He's not going to bring out his sword and start lopping off ladies' heads here. But uh, but this could end really badly, right? I mean, if uh, you could imagine a circumstance in which Gareth is cozying up to her and he's like, I think that you are the most beautiful woman I've ever met. There was this other lady in this castle earlier, you know, yesterday that I left behind that I totally said I would love forever, but whatever, I am ditching her and I am going to adhere to you because you are hot lady, right? Had he delivered that line, you could, you could easily, David, imagine her being all like, uh, dude, right? Like I am that lady and you're cheating on me, right? You're cheating on me with myself. Like that is not cool. Uh, is this what I can, I mean, you can, again, you could see this easily going very, very badly. Right. Um, but of course that's not what happens. All of these lookers aspired. Sir G now, first of all, David, you notice one of the reasons why, right? The looks are mutual. She mod him passing good cheer, and he here again, and they had goodly language and lovely. They had goodly language and lovely countenance, right? There is mutual flirtation between the two of them. Um, Tarloniel says, this isn't a test? How unexpected. Yeah, in a sense it is, right? Or Tarloniel, perhaps in a sense we can see this is the two of them kind of passing, the test. These two are just meant for each other, right? They can't help it. In a sense, you could say his falling completely head over heels for this strange lady that he meets is almost like Lancelot being kind to Gareth when he was working in the kitchen, right? It's like he just naturally... He falls in love with this lady, and of course she turns out not to be the wrong lady, but the right lady, right? He doesn't know he's falling in love with the right lady, um, but he does. And he does because he's good, right? It's it, In a sense, it's very, um, again, it's almost like, uh, it's almost like, passing the test. Um, oh, no, Katriana, he doesn't think that she's the other dude's wife, that, there's, that she's a different person, right? So there's, um, Sir Gringamore seems actually to have a wife who is there. And then also the sister, right? So it seems to be the four of them, right? Gringamore and Gringamore. And so there's Sir, Gr Sir Gringamore and Mrs. Gringamore, right? And then there's Leoness and Gareth. Um, I don't think that Leonette is there. Because he would certainly recognize her, even though he doesn't recognize Leoness. Um, uh, so I think it's I, th I think it's the four of them. So he does not think that she's married. Um, yeah, that I think that I think is pretty certain. Okay. Um, all right. All these locus aspired Sir Gringamore, and then after supper he called his sister Dame Leoness until a chamber and side. So he pulls her aside, right? And he's like, "Fire, sister." I have well aspired your countenance betwixt you and this knicked, and I wall, sister, that ye wit he is a full noble knicked, and if ye can mock him to abide here, I will do him all the pleasure that I can, for an ye were better than ye are, ye were well be watered upon him. Right? Sir Gringamore's very practical approach to this. He's like, okay, sister, I see that the two of you are making eyes at each other. Great work. I think this is fantastic. Let's run with this, sister, right? Because, dude, this guy is King Arthur's nephew, right? This guy is a catch right here. So reel him in, sister. Let's do this. Right? I mean, that, that's, honestly, that's what I take from Sir Gringamore here. Um, now, Sir Gareth isn't thinking this way. I don't think that Leoness is thinking this way either, 
But this is what the brother's thinking, right? Fire brother, sighed Dom Leonas. I understand well that the knicht is a good knicht, and come he is out of a noble house. Notwithstanding, I will assay him better. Howbeit, I am most beholden to him of any earthly man, for he hath had great labour for my love, and passed many dangerous passages. So she says, okay, I, I, yeah, he qualifies, right? He's a good knight, and he's come out of a noble house. Sure. Um, here's how I read this next sentence. I think that we can see her weakening, in a sense, in his resolve, in her resolve, right? She says, notwithstanding, so despite the fact that he's proven himself in arms, despite the fact that we know now, because we kidnapped his dwarf in order to find out, um, we know now that he's come not only of gentle, but of royal lineage. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a king of son of father side and mother side, right? So it's, that's all good. It doesn't get better than that. Um, so great lineage, great prowess in battle, Notwithstanding, I will assay him better. This is what courtly love ladies are supposed to do. I'm going to assay him better. I'm going to put him to the... I'm going to see how obedient he's going to be. I'm going to set him certain tasks. Kind of like, you know, Sir Ironside's lady set for him. She was a good courtly love lady. Like, she was kind of doing it right. Now, the whole, like do horrible things and put people to a shameful, you know, murder folks and put them to a shameful death. That's not exactly cricket. So it's not like that's, uh, you know, uh, normal for a courtly love lady. That's not the point. Um, but, uh, but nevertheless, doing that kind of thing, like in order to prove yourself that you are worthy of my love, you should do X, Y, and Z, even if they are really, uh, um, uh, you know, elaborate things that they're supposed to do or, or, uh, very difficult, challenging things and waiting for at least a year. Those things are all standard, right? So she says, okay, but, it's, but don't worry, I'm going to do the standard courtly love lady thing, right? I mean, obviously that's a given, right? Um, but then she says, how be it, how be it, I am most beholden to him of any earthly man, right? I, but you know, come to think of it, I really owe him a lot, right? More than I owe anybody else. He saved me, right? He hath had great labor for my love and passed many dangerous passages. She's like, maybe I can let him off on time served, right? Maybe, maybe he's actually already done enough to prove himself. She starts off that sentence saying, okay, right, maybe, fine. But, you know, granted, I'm going to play this like a good courtly lady should. And then she's kind of talking herself out of it, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, Karita, I, I think he might be cuter up close than he was from a distance, especially, you know, like in full armor where she couldn't see him. All she could see was like that he was big. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so they come back from the side chamber. Right. And Thon Sergareth went unto the laddy Dame Lioness, still doesn't know who she is, and kissed her many times and either made great joy of other. And there she promised him her love, and certainly to love him and none other dies of her life. Okay, it's over. All right, so now keep in mind, the kiss, super important, right? When the lady bestows the kiss, which is called the kiss of promise, upon the would-be courtly lover, um, that's, a, that's sealing the deal. I remember lip to, uh, mouth to mouth kiss was part of the 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 oath of fealty, right? So it's it's uh, it's it's like the contract sealing, right? So when she kisses him, she's bypassed the whole I'm going to test you out for another year, right? She's now definitely decided to circumvent that. We're going to go straight to being accepted lovers of each other, right? And they're both happy, right? Here they are making it so mutual. They're making great joy of each other. Um by the way, one of the things that's so charming about these scenes, I have a hard time thinking of any single example, like in the entirety of medieval literature, where the love, affection, and even sexual desire is so mutual on both sides, right? That just, it's not unknown, but it's kind of rare um, for it to be expressed like this. Um, and it's really, it's really cute. Um... 
And so she, she's she's promised him, right? First she kisses him, then she gives him her promise, certainly to love him, and none other dies of her life. Than this laddie, than, than this laddie, Dame Leoness, by the assent of her brother, told Sir Gareth all the truth what she was, and how she was the Sam laddie that he did battle for, and how she was laddie of the Castle Perilous. Oh, and I am that lady. Right. Kind of changed my mind about the year thing. And now in retrospect, me saying that a year is going to pass faster than you think sounds kind of funny because it's like the, that was like the day before yesterday. Right. So, uh, yep, Yeah. Boy, that year passed really fast, didn't it? And there she told him how she cowsed her brother to talk away his dwarf for this cows to know the to know the certain what was your name and of what kin were ye were come. And then she let fet before him her sister Lynette that had ridden with him many a whilesome way. Then was Sir Gareth the more gladder than he was to fore. I bet he was. Now he's like, oh, hey, great. So I haven't been unfaithful to the lady. It's her all along. Right. So exactly. You know, David, remember the um, the whole the potential for disaster. Right. Poop just vanishes. Right. Everything has turned out well because they're both great. Right. Uh, you know, they're both they're both good. They're both happy. They're both mutually in love. She is deserves him and he deserves her. This is this is how it is supposed to go. Right. OK. And then they truth plight other to love and never to file while their life lasteth. And so they brent both in a hot love that they were accorded to abat their lustes secretly. And there Dom Leoness counselled Sir Gareth to sleep in none other place but in the hall, and there she promised him to come to his bed a little before, a little afore midnight. Okay, so now we have a secret assignation set up. Now they've been truth plighted. They're planning to get married. This is an engagement. Um, the promise has already been made, like the courtly love promise has already been made. And then they go straight to marital engagement. This might sound like the natural course of things, right? This might sound like, you know, and so it doth follow as the night the day, right? That is not true. This here, this has deviated from the system. They've been the idealized, almost the stereotypical courtly lady and courtly lover. Um, they've already started to deviate in her relenting. Right. Um, the sort of honesty and genuineness of their feelings for each other and of her respect for him, rather than saying, no, no, I'm going to be mean and I'm going to keep being cold and I'm going to make him prove himself more and more and more. That's what a, like a good courtly love lady should do. Like it's totally, um, you know, routine. She doesn't um, um, she doesn't do that. She relents. So that's already like the first crack in the idealized courtly love thing. Like it's things are not quite any longer proceeding in the direction that is typical. And now they're in getting engaged. Right. That's downright weird. Right. Um, uh, definitely weird. Right. You don't do that. Um, marriage disqualifies you for love. Right. It is not. We are very far away from marriage being the natural fruition of a love relationship. Um, it's not unknown. It's not totally unprecedented, but it is unusual. It's a little strange, right? <laughs> but then, okay. Uh, it, is, it is Lancelot's ideal, though. Yes, exactly. Um, it is following in line uh, with that. Now, remember, Lancelot, he was not anti-marriage on the whole. He didn't plan to marry, right? Because, like, if you get married, then you have to be a good husband, and being a good husband means you're not going to be able to be out on the nightly circuit all the time, right? So, you know, if 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 he wants to be free for adventures and tournaments and all those kinds of things, he can't get married because then he'd be a bad husband. Gareth seems to have no such restrictions, right? He's not concerned about that at all. Um, okay, so... Um, Exactly, Karina. Lancelot would say that. Well, it's not that he has to retire. It's just that he can't um, he can't be out all the time. Right. 
Um, yeah. Okay. But now we're going straight from the engagement to the consummation without passing the wedding in between, right? Okay, so um, they make this super secret assignation in the hall, right? <laughs> let's meet. Let's meet in the most public place in the whole castle, shall we? Yeah, that'll be great. That'll be great. Um, okay. I love that. So remember that passage uh, back with Sir Ban and Sir Bors where um, uh, I was all excited because you could prove that they were using sarcasm, which is not very common, or at least it's super hard to prove in a lot of medieval literature. Um, I love the tone of this first sentence. This is one of those places where, again, like sometimes you want to think that Mallory is kind of being wry and a little bit sarcastic in his tone. But you, but again, you can't be sure whether that's the tone that he actually or whether it's just us reading that tone into the line. Right. This this is a classic. Right. This council was not so privily kept, but it was understood. For they were but young both, and tender of age, and had not used such craft as to foreign. Right? They were total noobs at this, right? So uh, their super secret plans for their assignation was not kept so privily, but that everybody knew what the heck was going on, right? They thought they were being super sly, right? But uh, turns out, actually, they were, they were, yes, they were young, dumb, and bad at this. Uh, Curried, uh, absolutely. And again, also, it's, it's, it's a reflection of how, like, spontaneous their affection is. They're not devious, right? They don't, they're, there's, they're being secret because, you know, it is transgressive. Like, this, this would, yes, they're engaged, but they're not married yet. So, the, you know, this is still... Kind of, you know, they're kind of blurring the lines between paramours and marriage, right? Um, uh, kind of trying to have it both ways, right? In a sense. Um, <laughs> such craft is, I love. Not so privily kept is my favorite phrase from that sentence, but such craft is, is, uh, uh, is uh, my second favorite part. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, wherefore, the damsel Leonette was a little displeased. Okay, now the sister's gonna gonna have her say, right? And she thought her sister Dame Leonesse was a little over hasty, that she meek not abide her time of marriage, and for saving of her worship, she thought to abat their hot lustes. I'm gonna I'm gonna pour some cold water on this hot lust situation, right? Okay, the sister she's gonna she's she's throwing the flag here. She's like, okay, I gotta I I gotta intervene, and she let ordain by her subtle craft is oh dear, uh, subtle craft is that's that's always been a dangerous phrase, right? Let ordain by her subtle craft is that they had not their intentes, neither with other as in her delitas until they were married. She's going to take care of things so that they don't, uh, there's going to be no deletas, uh, you know, no, no partaking of delights prior to marriage, right? Leonette, she is the, uh, <laughs> she's the chastity police right here in the family. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, David Erbach says the sentence does imply that such craft is, are, is something older knights and ladies uh, might be expected to be more experienced with. Yeah, yeah. Sir Gawain would be good at this, right? Um, but uh, but not uh, not Sir Gareth. Um, <laughs> just a little over hosty. And yeah, Karina, I think that's, a, again, some co slightly comical understatement, right? It was a little over hosty. Um, yeah, yeah. Now, Karina, we're not told exactly which sister is the older sister, right? But I've got to think, I've got to think that uh, 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 Leonette is the older sister. She's certainly acting like the older sister. Um, okay. <laughs> it gets better. Uh, okay. And so it passed on. At after supper was mad a clean avoidance that every lord and lady should go unto his rest. 
Now, notice, I think Sir Gringamore, I think, is into this, right? Sir Gringamore is like, okay, everybody go to bed. And I mean everybody go to bed, right? Let's clear the hall so that no one is around in the hall. Sir Gringamore, I mean, again, uh, everybody could kind of tell what was going on with the assignation plans, right? Sir Gringamore seems fine with things, not so Mionette. But Sir Gareth said plainly, he won't go no farther than the hall, for in such places, he said, was convenient for an errant knight to talk his rest in. Here's Sir Gareth not being subtle, right? I think I'm going to sleep right here in the hall, as is convenient for knights errant. And that's totally why I'm sleeping in the hall, because I'm a knight errant, and that's what knight errants do. <laughs> right? Okay, Gareth. And so... There was ordained great couches, and thereon feather beddies, and there he lied him down to sleep. And within a, sh within a while come Dame Lyonesse, rapid in a mantle, furred with ermine, and laid her down by the sides of Sir Gareth, and therewithal he began to clip her and kiss her. Okay, so we're proceeding now. Things proceeding uh, much more enthusiastically uh, than with Sir Persons' daughter. And therewithal he looked before him and saw an armed knight with many lichtes about him. And this, so there are many lights around him. He's surrounded by light, like floating lights about this night. And this knight had a long gizarn in his hand and made a grim countenance to smite him. Once Sir Gareth saw him come in that wise, he leapt out of his bed and got in his hand a sword and leapt toward that knight. Remember, Sir Gareth not wearing a lot of clothing at this point, right? And when the knight saw Sir Gareth come so fiercely upon him, he smote him with a foin through the thick of the thigh, that the wound was a shaft mond broad, and had cut a toe many vines and sinews. So he's got a pretty bad, a pretty bad thigh wound here, right? And therewithal, Sir Gareth smote him upon the helm such a buffet that he fell groveling. And then he leap over him, and unlaced his helm, and smote off his head from the body. And then he bled so fast, that he meek not stunned. But so he lied him down upon his bed, and there he sooned and lie as he had been dead. Okay, so, Leonette's... Oh, so a, a gizarn, that's a, it's a pole axe. Uh, but it's like a, it's like a, so it's a, like a, like a battle axe on a, kind of like a halberd, something like that. So imagine a staff with a spiky bit at the top and an axe head as well, right? That's what he's got in his hand. And so he ends up foining him. So he stabs him through the thigh with the broad headed spear at the top of the shaft, right? Okay. So this is a pretty abrupt interruption of what looked like it was going to be a charming evening for Leoness and Sir Gareth, right? Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so um, this is, you might say, a rather extreme um, length to go to preserve the chastity of everybody involved, right? Not only is he attacked by an armed knight, but he's stabbed through the thigh. So he's like, okay, uh, again, like the whole, you know, the uh, uh, the uh, the consummation of their clumsily organized plan is unlikely to come off now, right? Now that he has a grievous thigh wound. Um, and um, uh, uh, yeah, so there's that. But also the arterial bleed might also be a dampener, right, on uh, any further, uh, further activities. Um, and Marilyn, this poor knight got decapitated, right? So that is like a certain amount of collateral damage seems to have happened here uh, in the course of the encouragement of chastity uh, by Dame Leonette. Um, so this is, it is really, really hard to get back in the mood after that. I mean, is this really, right? I mean, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so this is extreme already, and then it gets weird. And thar they staunched his bleeding as well they meeked, and great sorrow mad Sir Gringamore and Dame Leonesse. So Gringamore comes out, right? Gringamore, who I think knew perfectly well what was going on here, comes running out, and he and, he and, and his sister are trying to staunch the, the, the grievous wound uh, of, uh, of Sir Gareth. Meanwhile, I, I think Dame Leonesse is still not wearing very much, right? So it's kind of an embarrassing situation for everybody. And forthwithal, come Dame Leonette. 
and took up the head in the sect of her ball and anointed it with an ointment, thereas it was smitten off. So she takes her ointment and she rubs it on the stump of the neck, right? And in the Samwis, she dead to the other part, thereas the head stake. Okay, so she goes over to the stump of the neck on the corpse and rubs the ointment on that thing too. And then... And then she set it to getters, and it stuck as fast as ever it did. So she's reattached his head with the with the magic ointment. And then the knicked arose lightly up, and the damsel Leonette put him in her chamber. So then she leads the knight. She she gorilla glues his head back on, mighty Felix exactly. And then she brings him back to her bedchamber. The end. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay. Um, and de- <laughs> all this saw Sir Gringamore and Dom Leonesse, and so did Sir Gareth. And well he espied that it was Dom Leonette that had rode, that rode with him through p- the perilous passages. Ah, well, damsel, said Sir Gareth, who obviously has no idea what to say. I went ye would not have done as ye have done. I love this. I love this response. Again, no clue, right? No clue at all what to say. I didn't think you would do that, which is true in more than one sense, right? I didn't think that you would have put out a hit on me uh, for trying to sleep with your sister, which I thought everybody was okay with, right? I thought we were all on the same page here, and we were in the middle of the happily ever after, when all of a sudden you had me stabbed, right, and mostly killed. Uh, so I didn't think that you would do that. But also, he's got to be referring to the recapitation of this night, <laughs> right? I, I, I didn't think you would have done as you have done. I, I didn't have any, I have still have no idea how you did what you did, right? Um, yeah. Uh, I, no, Jennifer, this is not some sort of allegory. This is just... <laughs> This is just magical fairy weirdness that's going on here, right? Except, unlike the Green Knight of Sir Gowan and the Green Knight who picks up his head and then his head talks, um, this shows that that dude is a fairy, which we kind of already knew. I mean, when he comes in and he's huge like a giant and he's all green and his skin and hair are all green and his horse is all green, like, that's already kind of a giveaway. Like, you see him coming in and you're like, okay, probable fairy, right? Right picks up the decapitated head and the decapitated head talks to you, definitely fairy, right? Um, So fine. But um, this is different, right? This is very, very different um, in that the knight, like, is the knight even a guy? Um, (laughs) David Atlee says, I can't help but think of Chewie reassembling C-3PO, and I'm hoping Lynette got the head on straight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, but it gets even better. And so within a while, so uh, Sir Gareth takes a while to recover from this, right? This is part of the wait until marriage plan by Leonette because, uh, you know, they're not going to get married still for some time. You know, their wedding's still a ways off. So if you incapacitate him for a while, then, you know, okay, uh, things are better off. And so within a while, Sir Gareth was nigh whole and waxed licked and jocund and sang and danced it. Then again, Sir Gareth and Dame Leoness were so hot in brenning love that they marred their covenantes at the tenth nicht after that she should come to his bed. All right, let's try this again. And because he was wounded afore, he lied his armour and his sweared nigh his bed's side. And reeked as she promised, she come. And she was not so soon in his bed, but she espied an armed nicked, knicked, coming toward the bed, and anon she warned Sir Gareth, and lightly through the good help of Dame Leoness, he was armed. Okay, see, this time he's bringing his armor with him, right? Ah, fool me twice, shame on me, right? So she's like, quick! So they jump up, and she's attaching, she's buckling things, right, and attaching his armor. He's not going to get caught out like that again. Okay, uh... And they hurled togethers with great ire and malice all about the hall. Okay, so this time no single foin into his naked thigh, right? Now this time we're doing a fully armed battle. And there was great light as it had be the number of 20 torches, both before and behind. Remember there were lights around before. So this knight, the like recapitated knight, 
is he's like there's I don't know what is the is the light emanating from him? Is it just floating around him? Are there like I, are there floating lights before and behind? I don't I don't get the light thing. Is he in a spotlight right coming down from above? I don't I don't <laughs> I don't really know. Um, but anyway, okay. So Sir Gareth strined him so that his old wound brast again on bleeding. But he was hot and courageous and took no keep. I love that phrase. He took no keep. He didn't care. Uh, but with his but with his great force, he struck down the knecht and voided his helm and struck off his head. Okay, so we've re-decapitated the knight. But of course, he saw how this went last time, right? So this time again, Gareth is prepared. Then he hew the head upon an hundred pieces. And when he had done so, he took up all those pieces and threw them out a window into the ditches of the castle. <laughs> okay. This time, we are not having any recapitation of this knight. I'm going to chop up his head, then I'm going to chop up his head, and I'm going to chuck the pieces out the window. <laughs> okay. All right. That'll teach him, Sir Gareth. <laughs> okay. And by this done, he was so faint that Onethas he meek stand for bleeding. And by then, he was almost unarmed. He fell in a deadly soon in the floor. Uh, so he can barely get unarmed before, because now, of course, he's bleeding again. His old wound burst open for bleeding. And so now he's got, he's got again, blood gushing out of his thigh once more. Things are looking bad. Um, okay. Whew. Oh, boy. <laughs> Dora Stroke says they don't cover this in sex ed class. Yeah, no, my high school teacher didn't prepare me for this kind of situation either. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, but wait, there's more. So everyone comes in and tries and staunches his bleeding again. Rixo come this damsel Leonette before him all, and she had fet all the gobbets of the head that Sir Gareth had thrown out at the window. <laughs> she comes in, what, like in a basket? Or maybe in a cloth? Or is she just holding them piled up in her hands? The, the gobbets of the head of the knight that Sir Gareth chopped up and chucked out the window. And there she anointed it as she did before, and put them to the body in the seat of him all. <laughs> so she reassembles his head, and then reattaches the head. You, you can, you can ch you do what you like. You are not going to be able to undo this night. Whew. Well, damsel Leonette, sighed Sir Gareth, not quite so surprised this time. I have not deserved all this despite that ye do unto me. Sir Knecht, she sighed, I have nothing done, but I will avow it, and all that I have done shall be to your worship and to us all. Then was Sir Gareth staunched of his bleeding, but the leeches said there was no man that bare the life should heal him throughly of his wound, but if they healed him that cowsed the stroke by enchantment. Okay, so remember Gareth thought he was better. Right, he was up, he was dancing, right, things looked good. Um, but uh, uh, <laughs> but as soon as he was fighting again, the wound burst open. And so the leeches are telling him, like, okay, you know, the, the doctors, of course, um, are telling him, like, look, this wound is never going to fully heal. Uh, um, but uh, if, so, uh, if they healed them, that cows at the stroke uh, by enchantment. So, like, the person who caused this, this is an enchanted wound. Right. And so the person who caused this enchanted wound has got to participate in the healing of this wound or else it's not going to it's not going to. Um, yeah. Um, OK, so that's. Um, and I think, by the way, again, we can take their with their leeches. Right. If the leeches don't know, then who does? Um, so this is um, um, this is authentic medical advice that they're giving him here. So. <clears throat> Leonette has now, I don't even know, is this dude even a person? Like, is this, he's, he's, he, the knight sounds like a construct, right? I mean, is he a robot or something? I mean, it's really unclear. Like, notice he's never given a name, right? There's never any indication that he, he has no independent existence or any, at least not, you know, in the story, um, other than 
to uh, um, to do Dame Lynette's will in trying to get uh, him to break up the good times here, right? Um, uh, uh, Dolores Stroke, yes, uh, loin wounds are a recurring theme. Um, not everybody gets loin wounds, but they're not uncommon. Um, now, of course, that's perfectly understandable, right? Uh, like that is if you're riding on horseback, your legs are, are, are kind of exposed. So getting uh, pierced through your thighs or even through both of your thighs is a thing that happens. There are some people who will tell you that the saying that he was pierced through both thighs is merely a euphemism for castration. And I don't buy that, or at least I think that that is something, it might sometimes be true, but I think that can be over hastily um, applied, actually. Um, I'm not really convinced that that at least is always true. Um, but um, anyway, yeah, so uh, <laughs> a uh, home night and uh, home nightculus, uh, <laughs> Mike, something like that, something like that. Um, Anyway, yeah, um, so, right, see, so, yeah, Dolores Stroke, he's, like, castration would certainly, uh, go much further towards abating the lustus, you're absolutely correct, um, but, uh, no, she's not, Le Leonette is not, uh, anti-consummation in general, right, she is not an enemy of Venus, she is just, she just wants them to save it for marriage, right, uh, and sometimes, if you're an older sister, you gotta take some extreme measures, uh, right, to, uh, uh, to keep these, uh, to keep these uh, 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 hot Brenning young kids in line, right? I mean, you know, teenagers. So um, <laughs> anyway, oh, now David um, uh, Urbach, I totally agree with the statement you just made a couple minutes ago that this feels like a totally different story than the one that we've been reading up until this point. I absolutely agree with that. Um, this is uh, gotten weird all of a sudden. And the character of Leonette is, in particular, has gotten weird. Um, did you catch this? Um, Dame Leonette, after this, goes to Arthur's court um, to invite them out to a tournament, right? And then she goes back to where Gareth and everybody else is waiting for her. Juan Dom Leonesse was come to the Isle of Avalon. That was the same isle, thereas her brother, Sir Gringamore, dwelled. Then she told him all how she had done, and what promise she had made to King Arthur. Alas, said Sir Gareth, I have been so sore wounded with unhappiness, sith and I come into this castle, that I shall not be able to do at that tournament like a knight, for I was never truly whole sin I was hurt. Be of good cheer, said the damsel Leonette, for I undertook within this fifteen days to mock you as whole and as lusty as ever ye were. Oh, lusty, that's rich coming from her. And then she laid an ointment and salve to him as it pleased her that he was never so fresh, nor so lusty, as he was though. Yeah, David, turns out that Sir Gareth has been in the Isle of Avalon this entire time, and it turns out that this whole family he's marrying into lives in the Isle of Avalon. Which was kind of not mentioned <laughs> until this point. Now, it did, the name Avalon did come up once when we're told that like it, Avalon is nearby, right? But now we're being told that this is, in fact, uh, that, that Avalon is like Sir Gringamore's home, right? Um, so, David Urbach, as you're saying, all of a sudden we're in a different story, or rather things have been revealed differently. I mean, there's been something kind of fairy story about this whole thing from the beginning with the disguised knight, whom nobody knows who he is, and then the, the damsel who seems to be really mean to him but then turns out to be nice. And, uh, you know, it's had a kind of, as I say, a fairy story, a fairy tale element to it. Um, all we were missing was were the fairies, right? But except it turns out, no, we've not been missing them at all. They're all over the place, right? Everybody's a fairy except for Sir Gareth, right? Leonette is clear. She's not called a Lady of the Lake, 
yet, or a damsel of the lake, but it's clear that she is, right? That's like, she's obviously a damsel of the lake. And Sir Gringamore is a native of the Isle of Avalon. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, exactly, Darlonial. Surprise, we're in fairyland. Everything makes sense now in a nonsensical kind of way, or at least now we can understand why things have been nonsensical to this point, right? Um, yeah, so that's a really fascinating kind of reveal to me. And another example, another super tantalizing example of um, Maori sort of flirting with the fairy stuff, right? Bringing in the fairy, and yet, like, not just doing it on the side, right? Just, oh, and by the way, they've been on Avalon this whole time, and this is kind of a fairy story, but I didn't really, um, you know, kind of inform you of that until this point, right? Um, that's um, classic Mallory, right? Uh, in his sort of interest, but sort of uh, 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 distant interest in fairy stuff. Um Okay, so the good news is Sir Gareth and Dom Leoness do not have sex before marriage, but they do get married and presumably have sex thereafter and uh, uh, the, and move far away from their sister-in-law uh, so that they avoid any further complications to their love life. Um, notice the key word, though, that Gareth uses, which I think vindicates the admittedly peculiar tactics of the sister. I have been so sore wounded with unhappiness sith and I come into this castle that I shall not be able to do at that tournament like a knecht. Do you hear it, right? <clears throat> there should be a word that should jump out at you from that sentence, especially in the context here, right? What's the what's the important word there? Exactly, Deborah. Exactly, Mike. Yeah. Unhappiness. Unhappiness. I have been so sore wounded with unhappiness, Sith and I come into this castle. Just by bad fortune, right? By things going wrong, right? Um, remember Lancelot's doctrine of sexual morality, right? If you love someone paramours, bad stuff is going to happen to you through unhappiness, right? Or you're going to kill somebody by mishap, right? Um, Lancelot, exactly. Takako says, Lancelot somewhere is being like, see, I told you, young Padawan, right? You, 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 you were so close, but then you messed it up with the whole, like, let's not wait for marriage. Let's do the paramours thing in advance, right? Um, so, did unhappiness happen to you? Yes. Is it your fault? Yes, it is, Sir Gareth. But you know what? It's only temporary unhappiness, right? And he's able to be healed of the wound, and, and then he's... Because Lynette is there, right? And she she's the one who put this enchantment upon him. It was apparently an enchanted wound, which should not be a surprise at this point. And she's able to hear it, heal it with her magic ointment, because, yeah, I mean, if you can reassemble a head, you can certainly uh, seal up his wound here. Um... Uh, so, yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> no, no, Doris Stroke, I don't think the super chastity duct tape knight is Sir Lancelot. Yeah, no, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, that would be, uh, that would be quite the reveal, right? Um, but, um, anyway, yeah, so he, st he didn't quite stray from Lancelot's doctrine. He attempted to stray from Lancelot's doctrine and was thwarted by being given. And, and now he thinks like, look, see, now he's, he's, he is reaping what he attempted to sow, right? Which is now I'm not going to be able to do at that tournament like a knight, right? I'm, I'm, it's, you know, thanks to the unhappiness of this like semi-permanent thigh wound I now have, you know, I'm not going to be able to prove myself at this tournament like I, I wish I could, right? But Lynette heals him. You know what? At the end of the day, no harm done, right? 
because we abated your lusts and everything's fine now. Remember, she said before, everything I do is for your worship, right? Someday, she says, you're going to thank me for this. Really, I trust me. You're going to be glad that we went through this and it was all uh, for your benefit at the end of the day. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, and, 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 and he's better, right? And he goes back. So we see, first we see Sir Gareth again as like Lancelot's disciple, right? Lancelot's, uh, kind of knighthood. And we see him almost slip or attempt to slip, but fail to slip, right? And in the end he's spared. And so he remains, uh, the true disciple of Lancelot and successfully, Right, and goes off and proves himself and uh, is going to work his way up the leaderboard and is, is going to be basically accepted as the fourth. Um, that's what Sir Person said he could probably get up to, right? Um, accepted behind Lancelot and Tristram and Lamorak, and that's pretty much where Gareth is going to be. All right, I should let you go. There are a couple more things I wanted to talk about with the tournament. I don't want to go into too much great detail with the tournament. We'll talk a little bit about the Magic Ring. Um, and of course, I want to look at uh, the actions of Sir Lancelot and uh, uh, and his Gareth's interactions with Gawain, which are really interesting. But that won't take us too long. Just a few things at the beginning of cl uh, class next time. And then we're going to talk about the story of Sir Tristram. Sir Tristram and Isolde. Tristram and Isolde is one of the great love stories of the Middle Ages, right? We love the story of Tristram and Isolde. Um, this long book that we are starting in is called The Book of Sir Tristram. Do not get your expectations up in a sense, right? We're going to tell the story of Sir Tristram, <clears throat> but we're not going to be, this is, this book, which is called the book of Sir Tristram is not the book of Sir Tristram in the same sense that the previous ones have been the book of Lancelot and the book of Gareth. Um, this is going to digress and be a very great deal more. Um, anyway, we'll talk about that, um, uh, more next time. Um, so, Tristan, Tristram, Tristram, the end of Gareth and Tristram and Isolde uh, for next week. Thanks, everybody, for joining me tonight, and I will see you guys next week. Bye now. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org/fund.